resurrection. We've been saying happy resurrection weekend since we started yesterday. And uh, yesterday, the big thing was try not to say good morning and every time we say anything about the service. So if we say good afternoon to you today, just understand we're all a little confused. Hey, uh, great to have you here. It is the day we celebrate new life in Christ, the resurrection power of Jesus in us. And uh, if you don't know what that's all about, I hope you, you find that out today, what it means to have him really as the one who brings life to every part of your life. And so we'll get into that a little bit later. Just a couple of things. Just uh, take a, a moment, say a hey, happy Easter, happy resurrection day, whatever you like to say to one another. Just a, a couple of pieces before we get started with worship in just a moment. Uh, over here to the side where those candles are lit and then on the table up top, if you're upstairs there, uh, we have communion set up there. So at any time during our worship set, if you'd like to go and receive communion as part of your Resurrection Day worship, uh, feel free to do that. It's right there for you and right up there on the table. So anytime while we're singing, basically, just feel free to do that. And then also you were handed a card like this when you came in and this is just a survey we only do at Easter because Easter is the one time we kind of uh, see everybody in the church family in the course of the three services and so uh, just take a few moments at some point this morning and fill that out if you would and just on the back side of the card is blank like this except for mine which I scribbled on <laughs> but on the back side if you just let us know how long have you been part of Crossroads so uh, like less than one year or one to three years all that good stuff uh, kind of like you see right there, and that would be great. We just like to know how to serve you best, and uh, we know many of you have come in since COVID, so it'd be kind of good just to kind of see how many do we have that have uh, come in since then uh, and made this your church home. And as far as the part there where your name and address goes, just know we have a no-hassle guarantee. We're not going to come and visit you. I'm watching basketball today. Nobody's bringing you cookies or coming to your house, so don't worry about that, uh, but uh, that's just you know to have contact information for you, and uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later. But yeah, let's, uh, let's just take a moment, if we could, and open up our hearts to what God wants to say to us this morning. The uh, song we're going to start with is a song that really, here at Crossroads, has been kind of like a song for the season. It's been a heart song for us these last several months, and it's a song that, in addition to that, so beautifully expresses what today is all about in our faith in Jesus Christ. So let's take a moment and pray, and then we'll go into that worship together. So God, we just say thank you, Lord, that we can be in this place today. Thank you that your spirit is here with us. And, and Jesus, as we talked about communion a moment ago, we do uh, just do all things in remembrance of you. We do all things today, Lord, remembering what you did for us, Christ Jesus, and going to the cross for us, but what you did in proving you could bring resurrection, life, and power to us for every part of our lives, all the broken, dead places you bring life to if we'll just walk with you, if we'll put our faith in you, if we'll crown you as king. So God, I pray that that would be our story today. This song that we're about to sing, that it's just a, a, a song of truth for us because it's, it's a testament of, of, of what our story has been, what our journey has been with you. And so it's in your name, Jesus, we pray all these things. Thank God. 
Lord, for us to come. I see bright crimson robes draped over the ashes. A wide open tomb where there should be a casket. The children are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Roses in bloom, pushed up from the amber. Rivers of tears flow from good times remember. Families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. after he healed the, the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. Um, starts in verse 23. It says that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. And the commentary, one of the commentaries that I've read is um, that, that, that line is passed from death into life. The definition is, has changed his country or place where he lives. Death is the country where every Christless soul lives. The man who doesn't know God lives a dying life or a living death. But he who believes in the Son of God passes over from the empire of death to the empire of life. And I just, that's why we can sing this song right now. So let's, uh, let's sing that bridge one more time. I see bright crimson robes draped over the ashes A wide open tomb where there should be a casket Children are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming The roses in bloom pushed up from the end Rivers of tears flow from good times remembered Families are singing and dancing in life. The Father is welcome. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glory of sound. And the great cloud of witnesses all gather round. Cause the ones that were lost are finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our
I'll sing that with me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross where my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling.
as he carried my weakness, the things that I don't wish to speak of, that have lobbied to define me, to misalign me, to disqualify me. He carried my grief, grief which no words can do justice, but I don't need words because this lamb came as me and he knows me intimately. I see a lamb pierced for my rebellion every thorn violently shredding his head and every nail breaking skin, his body crushed for my sin, the breaking of his body so mine could be whole. Oh, my soul cries out. I see a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Your body bore my sickness, my disease, my pain. I pray the image in my mind of your blood stains is never erased or minimized by my familiarity with this story. How can we grasp your glory, how you set aside your divinity, bearing every burden of humanity? If you don't have a glimpse of the Father's love, this looks like insanity. But you didn't have just a glimpse. You share his heart. 
So from the start, you were committed to seeing this through. You took till death to us part seriously in this covenant, knowing full well that your death would not part God from man, but it would impart eternal life, inviting the church to be your eternally wedded wife. So we stand here at this altar, confessing our love for you, sharing our vows and wonder that you have chosen us, paid every debt in full, borne every curse brought upon us so that we may walk in freedom and blessing. And what God has put together, let us not put asunder. Oh yes, we stand and wonder and all we can say in response is worthy. Worthy is the lamb, worthy. All we can do is fall to our knees and praise you for you alone are worthy. Worthy of all glory and honor and power. Here till eternity, this voice I will raise and praise you. You are worthy. Worthy, worthy. For I see the lamb sitting on the throne.
to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. You can have a seat. for me, so it's close. I got to jump it. Maybe I ought to come up this side, Leanne. I'm going to start coming up this side over here. Yeah, um, I was telling them last night <laughs> that uh, Sharon and I had an opportunity to go a few years back to a service over in Houston, and at that church, man, like they had a, they had a huge choir, and so they had this big choir loft deal up there, this big, with the, like stands sort of that everybody sang in in the choir. And during the prayer at the end of like the worship set and the end of the choir deal, while somebody is praying on the stage, they hit a button and this whole thing goes down into the stage. It like disappears, except they hadn't oiled it in a while when we were there. So it's like, like, what is going on back there? Man? So I wasn't on the stage, but I was down here looking up like, goodness gracious, they need to oil that thing. So we're going to do that, Sharon. We're going to make it where the whole worship band just disappears under the stage. We look up like, the rapture happened, and only the worship team got to go. What happened? So anyway, so glad you're here today. Uh, I was kind of thinking about what to talk about today, and I was reminded of something that Sharon and I 
were blessed to do. Last summer, my wife Sharon, uh, we were able to go to the United Kingdom. Uh, we run, went over there to go to, to Wales, actually, which is in the western part of the island, and an amazing place. We went to Falderbrennan um, kind of prayer center, retreat center out there. It was phenomenal. But on the way, just west of the airport of London Heathrow, is the town of Windsor, and Windsor is the home of Windsor Castle. And, uh, and this is what it looks like. Um, it's, it's a small little dinky little place, you know. I, I would not lower my standards to live there. But, <laughs> but you see how it's kind of got this walkway coming out here? like this. Um, this actually goes for several miles, and it's called the Long Walk. And our hotel, we were in this old uh, traditional hotel, beautiful place down there, was right on that. And we just came right out, walked right across the grass and did the Long Walk and walk up here. And we only stayed there one night because after that, they had me stay here. And this is called Pastor Terry's Tower right here. And I'm just kidding. And uh, so, you know, the, the queen back then, she wasn't feeling well, and she wanted to talk to me. And Anyway, uh, just kidding. Uh, but, but anyway, it's an amazing, amazing place. But what's incredible about that, that is where uh, they stay a lot. The royal family stays quite a bit. But they also have in London, which is, you know, like 20 miles. I mean, in London, they have Buckingham Palace. And it's no slouchy place either. It's pretty incredible. Uh, and then they have like 30 other residences all around the island. Uh, they even have one called Ivy Cottage, and I said, oh, that's got to be a dump, and I looked it up like, oh, no, <laughs> it's way nicer than any of our houses, incredible, and so I, I was just thinking about that, because it's where, like, now King Charles, before his mom, Queen Elizabeth, but now King Charles, uh, he, he gets to live in all of those places, as well as other people who are in the royal family, and, and I was just thinking about that, because the reality is we look at something like that and like, my goodness, that is so magnificent and there's so much history and it's so amazing. And what would it be like to, to you know, even go to a place like that, much less have access to all those places as my places, right? What would that be like? And I was thinking about that in light of something the Bible tells us about Jesus, that Jesus is King Jesus. He is risen King, like royalty. And, and that's something for us as Americans, you know, uh, we're we the people, which is awesome. I love it. We're a democracy. I love that about us. But, but it's unique in a kingdom where, like, the king is the sovereign, like, appointed by God, sovereign leader of the land is, is, is how they see it. And, and because of that, they have access to all of that kind of stuff. And so what I was thinking about for us as people who follow King Jesus who have committed our lives to King Jesus, who have crowned him as king, honestly, the life that we have in all of eternity, even the life we have now, makes all of that pale in comparison. I was never interested in any of the royal family stuff uh, until I went over there. And I went over there and came back, like, I ought to learn something about this. It's probably like an important part of history. <laughs> so I started learning about it, watching documentaries on it, and you know, all the stuff, there's all kinds of stuff you can learn about them. None of them seem like happy people to me. Have y'all ever, have you seen any of that? They're like some of the most, bless their hearts, they're, they're just some of the most miserable people in, in the world and, and just their, the morality or their ethics or their lack thereof and the way they treat each other and the way they kind of look down on all the commoners. By the way, we're all commoners, so just kind of look at the person beside you and say, hey, you're a commoner. You're a low-life commoner <laughs> in the kingdom. In fact, in fact, you know, we like, we like, we like, you know, we like, we don't even want to be a part of your kingdom anymore. We're Americans. We like, we rebelled against all of that. But, but, but the idea, the idea is that as a Christ follower, as someone who's under the lordship of King Jesus, we have access to so much life, so much life. But, but this is what I want you to get today. The only way you get to that life, the only way you get there is you have to crown Jesus as your king. In other words, you have to like pledge allegiance to him. You have to submit your will, your rights, and your, to like all control of who you are to, to, to him. He has to be your, your king. Not just you know, the hope of heaven when you die, that's good, and, and you know, we worship him for his amazing grace and, and how great his love is. That's absolutely true. But it's like, no, you are Lord of every area of my life. And, and what I want you to see is there is a life available to you in this life, a life available to you certainly in the life that is to come that is only available when you consciously make a decision to crown him as your king. And that's like a daily deal. I mean, you make this decision, but it's kind of like a daily deal because <laughs> you guys know, right? Life goes on and every day you get up, there's something else competing for your lordship. There's, there's something else competing for your attention, for your loyalty every day. 
And, and it could be something as, as small as, a, as, you know, just like, yeah, I really want that, and I'm not even going to pray about that, to something that could totally wreck your life, right? And sometimes we're on the, like, some of us are in the middle of that, and some of us are on the other side of that right now. And God's like, no, I have life for you. I have life for you. If you'll do life under my lordship, under my kingship, under my authority, there's life for you. If you just want to have a little faith and check into church every now and then, just have enough grace to hopefully make it into heaven, kind of like a country song, you know, I won't get into that whole thing. But, uh, but you know, just, you know, that's just about how much I want, then you're missing out on life. You're missing out on life. You have to crown him as king. So that's what I want to help you with today. We've been in this series called Jesus Is. And we just looked at a lot of different th- names or descriptions of Jesus in Scripture, that Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the Lamb of God we looked at last week. And today, Jesus is the risen King. So my favorite verse for uh, Easter every year, uh, and if I, even if I don't teach on it, is Romans eight eleven, because there's so much hope in this verse, okay? So, so look at what this verse says. Romans eight eleven says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. So so just think about that. As a Christ follower, if you put your faith in Jesus, the spirit of the living God, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that's pretty powerful, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, like is inside of you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. This is what I want you to see. There's resurrection power in you. There's life-giving power in you. And it's not just for heaven when you die. Jesus said in John 10.10 that he came that we may have life and life to the full. It's for now. It's for in this life as well. There's a life Jesus came to make available to you. Resurrection life, resurrection power. But that happens like that. Your, your ability to experience that is in direct proportion to your willingness to submit your life to him, to make him king of your life. And the areas that you try to kind of hang on to is like, okay, Jesus, you can have that because I don't want to go to hell. Jesus, you can have that because I really don't want to wreck this as bad as I've wrecked it before. But, but I'm going to kind of hang on to this area and I'll hang on to my career and, and I'll hang on to all these different relationships. I'll hang on to my finances. I'll hang on to whatever. Like I'm going to, I'm going to grab onto this and hang on to that. You're not Lord of those things. You're not king of those things. To the extent that we do that, we, we rob ourselves. <laughs> we cheat ourselves of, of the life and the power the blessings that God has for us. So this is kind of, if you want the sermon in a sentence, it would be that the resurrected king, the risen king, the resurrected king can resurrect me. Every part of your life, he can resurrect you, but only to the extent that you make him king. So I keep referring to Jesus as King Jesus. Why, why, why is that? Um, it's, it's in the Bible in a lot of places, but one reason is uh, that was the charge that was made against him it's the charge that actually put him, the criminal charge that actually put him on the cross. And so what they had set up as a form of governance then, remember, was the Roman Empire. So you had the emperor of Rome. He's the head honcho over everything. Uh, he had his local regional Roman rulers. In the case of where Jesus lived, that ruler was named Pilate. He represented Rome. He represented the emperor and his authority in that region where Jesus lived, where the Hebrews lived, where the Jewish people lived. And then they also appointed a puppet king who was a Jewish person, but he was really just a puppet of the empire, and his name was Herod. So they had their kings. They really, in effect, had like three kings. The emperor was the king, <laughs> and then Pilate was kind of like the local king, and then there was another guy. They let him, they let him just call himself king. King Herod's the only one who actually called himself king, but, uh, but, but he got to call himself king, but he was purely a puppet to Pilate and to the emperor. So you kind of see the picture? Okay, so, so any mention that Jesus might be the king of the Jewish people, the king of the Hebrew people, that was going to be met with a lot of resistance, and it absolutely was. It's part of what led to Jesus going to the cross. And so look at Matthew 27, 11. Uh, This is after Jesus is arrested and he's on trial. And it says, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And I like how Jesus answers. He just says, you have said so, (laughs) which is a a weird kind of way to answer. But what he's just saying is like, you know, it's like saying, you know that I am. Yeah, yeah, yes, I am. He's, He's already declared that. I am 
the king of the Jews. This, this is who I am. Okay, so I just want you to see this is who Jesus said he was. This is what Scripture tells us about Jesus. And so that's what they actually charged him with, which is why, for him, they dressed him up like a king. They, they made fun of him for saying he was a king. Like, oh, really, you're a king? Let me show you what we do to kings. And this is what they did in Matthew 27, 28, and 29. It says they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. That's the symbol of being a king, a scarlet robe on him. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns. And you guys have all seen that many times. A crown of thorns that when they placed that on his head, of course, it would bleed down his face and, and his body. They twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff, kind of a scepter, in his right hand, a staff, which is a symbol of authority. This is a symbol that he is king, a symbol of authority. They put that in his hand, and then it says they knelt in front of him and mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews, making fun of him, mocking him, Hail, King of the Jews. Did they believe he was king of anything? No, not, not at all. They're, they're mocking him. Okay. Now, later, we see in the story that at least one of them did later in the story. But at this point, nobody believes he's king of the Jews. Nobody believes he's king of anything. They're just making sport of him. They're just making fun of him. Okay? So I just want you to consider this thought that not like that exactly, but I think in a lot of ways in our Christian faith, especially here in the Bible Belt and kind of how we've been raised up around Christianity and church and things of God for so long in our culture here especially, um, I, think, I think we can in a sense mock God. And what, what I mean by that is we, we want just enough faith in God to, to be forgiven. We want just enough faith to be given a pass to heaven, to miss hell. We want just enough faith to kind of make things kind of work in our lives, but not so much faith that our lives are totally submitted to him. In other words, that prayer that we pray so often here that we've taught you to pray here of Jesus, I submit to you my will, my rights, and all control. Like, ah, I don't know about all that. <laughs> I want to get to heaven. I want a few blessings here and there, but I don't want life to go bad for me, but that's, I want to submit my will, my rights, and all control. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. And, and when, we, when we, like, we just want a little bit of Jesus, but not all that Jesus offers us, we want him to be our Savior, but not necessarily our Lord and King. There's a sense where we're kind of mocking who he really was and who he really is and what he actually did for us. Go on to verse 37. It says this, they put him on the cross, you know, uh, and it says above his head they placed the written charge against him. So the Romans, when they crucified you, they would put the charge, you know, murderer, whatever it was you had done, whatever the charge was that you were being crucified for, rebel or whatever it was, revolting against the emperor, whatever that was, whatever that charge was that you were being put to death for under Roman law, that charge would be placed above your head on the cross that you were being hung on. And on Jesus's, it was placed above his head, and it was written in three languages, just as it was for everyone else. It was written in Latin. It was written in Greek, which is kind of like the fancy way of talking, kind of like a you know, the old English for us, maybe, I don't know. And then uh, it was written in Aramaic, and Aramaic would be like the, um, you know, like we talk, okay? <laughs> With a little lanya up in there and all the other stuff, just common language, okay? But the bottom line is they want everybody to know what his charges were. So they wrote it in these three different languages. And, and that was placed above his head. And what it said on that sign was the actual charge. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And so he was kind of made fun of for that because that's what his disciples and what the Holy Scriptures had, had said and what Jesus had said about himself, that he was this, this king. But, but now he's, he's dead <laughs> on the cross. And, and even his disciples, I mean, just think about this. His closest followers he had poured three years of his life into, right? And, and then some. His closest followers, once he's put on that cross, they're gone. All except for one, John. John stayed, stayed with him, stayed with his mother and took care of Mary right there at the cross, actually. But all the rest, including Peter and, and, and John's brother James, and they, they're just they're gone. All the rest of them are gone. They're like, oh, man, uh, if that happened to him, what's going to happen to us? <laughs> and, and they're booking it. They're, they're getting out of, out of sight, okay, uh, and, and just trying to lay low. So what made them change? Why would they go from being in hiding 
Why would they go from being in absolute fear of their lives, not wanting to lose their life because of Jesus, who's now dead? What would make them change and risk their lives and eventually even lose their lives, and many of them in horrific ways, being crucified upside down and beheaded and all kinds of horrific things done to them. Why, why would they go from just being in hiding, like, I'll never want to hear about Jesus again. I'll never say anything about Jesus again. I'm just going to live my life. I'll go back to fishing, collecting taxes, whatever, but I'm not, I'm not doing this Jesus thing anymore because I see what happens when you do the Jesus thing. You die, okay? They went from that, they went from that to being totally, absolutely committed, submitted to the lordship and kingship of Jesus. What changed? What switched? And what changed, what switched, in fact, it's the only thing that even makes any sense logically, is they absolutely saw the resurrected, risen King Jesus. And when they saw, and not just them, by the way, the Bible says 400 other witnesses over the course of 40 days, when they saw Jesus, when they saw the resurrected, risen Jesus, I mean, they knew he was dead, 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 okay? But when they saw him and he was raised again on that third day, and then they spent those 40 days with him, at the end of that, they're like, goodness, he really is who he said he was. And they gave their entire lives, all the rest of their lives, to getting that message out there. And just, just think about this. You're sitting here in Moss Bluff, Louisiana, and I don't know how many of you are of, of Hebrew background, but probably not many of you. Most of you would be what the Bible would call Gentiles. You're not, not Jewish. You don't have this Hebraic faith tradition. And you're here in Moss Bluff, Louisiana, and you know about Jesus. And Jesus was in this little bitty part of the Roman Empire. He wasn't like in Italy. He wasn't like one of the big major parts of the empire. He's in this little bitty sliver here, okay, that we call Israel, nine miles wide, this little bitty place. And, and, and thousands of years ago, thousands of miles away from here, and you know about him. Why? Why? All across the world today, churches are celebrating this day. Why? Because he was raised from the dead. And because resurrection power, resurrection life and, and love of Jesus flowed into those disciples. <laughs> and they, they're like, I, you know, all I know is what I saw. All I know, it is real, and, and I've got to tell everybody I can about it. And it went from this person to this person to this city to this city to this nation to this nation to thousands of years to you right now in Moss Bluff. Amazing to even think about. How, this before the internet, okay? Now you can do it, right? The whole world, <laughs> just about, right? Not then. We're talking ships and walking and just talking. No picking up the phone even. No landlines even, right? And you know about him here. Why? Because they believe what they saw. They saw the risen King Jesus. And then they welcomed in that resurrection power, that resurrection life into themselves as they crowned him as their personal king. So the Bible just kind of points that all out. Jesus also said this about himself, just a couple of things uh, that we see in Scripture. A little bit later, we looked at Matthew 27 and Matthew 28. It says, Then Jesus came to the disciples and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How much authority has been given to Jesus? You know what that makes him? The king. <laughs> king of king and Lord of lords. Even under our democracy, he's still king, okay? Um, he's king. And so uh, I love how Paul says it, as he, and he wrote this letter to uh, the church in Philippi. He says this in uh, Philippians 2, 8 through 11. He says, And Jesus, being found in appearance as a man, even humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. Who's at the highest place? The king, right? Okay, the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, and, and at that name every knee should bow, and in heaven, on heaven, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's another word for king. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's over all to the glory of God the Father. And then just the last one I'll give you. <laughs> this is the description of Jesus in Revelation 19, and the whole description is incredible. You ought to go read it, the first, the first uh, 15 verses of this. But we'll just look at verse 16. Um, it says, On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. 
Some dude told me one time, he says, I think that was a tattoo, man. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, it was on his thigh. How could it have been on his thigh? He had to have a tattoo. So I don't know. Maybe there are tattoo artists in heaven. I don't know. And uh, go, I mean, I'm sure there are tattoo artists in heaven. That's not what I mean. The tattoo artists don't go to heaven. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is maybe he had a, a heavenly one like, time to get some ink. You're raised from the dead, brother. Getting after it. Yeah. And uh, Jesus is like, is that sanitary? I'll heal it. Don't worry about it. All right. Okay. So king of kings and lord of lords. Okay. <laughs> all right. So here's the deal. This, this is all I want you to see right now. Okay. So Jesus is the king. All right. He is the king, period. He, he's king of kings and lord of lords. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. He is the king. Someday every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is lord. Okay. So he absolutely is the king. But he only becomes your king. <laughs> like, like he's king. Okay. But he only becomes your king when you crown him as king. That's your decision to make. He only becomes your king when you crown him as king. So uh, a, a guy in my small group is Mr. Ray, Ray Wood. And uh, Ray's a, a man who I've known from Dynamic Dimensions from the gym uh, for a long time. Neither one of us look, at, look like it, but we do go to the gym a lot. Um, we just drink a lot of coffee, but we, do, we go to the gym. And, uh, but but uh, that's how I've known him for years there. And for years, I talked to Ray about uh, you know, just about church, or we, we just had getting little conversations about this or that, and he'd always say, well, I'll never go to church, <laughs> but if I ever do go to church, I'm going to go to your church, and, but which, which was his way of saying, I'm never going to go to church, <laughs> so, uh, so um, that, that was just the way it was, and so I did get him to go to church one time, but that was for, to do a little fly fishing class, that was it, so we were talk about doing one anyway, and that was the closest he got, but he, we had nothing going on here that day, it's just me and him, but uh, he, anyway, he finally, he finally came to the place in his life where he did make Jesus as king. And now he goes to three churches. Uh, his, his wife now is, is Catholic, so they go there. Uh, he comes here and he kind of calls this his church home, but he also goes to first back here because uh, he wants to get a second opinion. And, and I understand. <laughs> Sometimes I listen to my teaching like, yeah, they ought to get a second opinion. Okay, so, you know, <laughs> so anyway, I want you to see a little bit of Ray's story, and then we'll move on from there. Hi, my name is Ray Wood. I, uh, I come to Crossroads Church, and we go to two other churches also. Um, the video is why I got baptized. Uh, a little backstory to that is my wife was sick with cancer, and people would tell me to pray. And I didn't know how to pray. I wasn't a Christian. I was. I thought I was a good person, but I just wasn't going to church. I didn't have God in my heart. So when my wife died, I really knew I had a problem in my life. So I asked a friend if I could go to church with them. And, and so I started going to church. I knew Terry from the gym and I always told him I would go to his church first. And I had to apologize because I didn't go to his church the first time. And obviously he said, ah, no problem. So I started going to church and then I started, I felt something that I needed in my life. So I went to Faith Walk. And during Faith Walk, I had a friend that was my table leader to give some testimony. And he was talking about how he found God and, and Jesus in his heart. And what really broke me down to accept Jesus and God was when he said that his daughter said, if dad can do it, I can do it. And our whole faith walk thing was legacy what we leave to our children and our grandchildren. So I broke down and accepted Jesus in my heart. And in the meantime, I found a lady that I wanted to marry. And so during the wedding ceremony, I asked her if it was okay uh, to surprise all my friends and to be baptized on the day of our wedding. And she agreed because, you know, marriage is a bond with uh, two people blessed by God. So 
That's why I did it. This is what you're seeing. So, thank you. I would have baptized him, man, but I'm not messing up my suit. Sorry. So I was styling and profiling. I'm not messing it up. So, no, uh, the guy who baptized him, that was Ryan Thibodeau. Ryan's a friend of this house and uh, had a long relationship with Ryan. And, uh, but Ryan was his table leader at Faith Walk, and so he wanted Ryan. It was Ryan's testimony that really kind of led him to that faith in Jesus. So uh, Ray uh, is, is so cool. He's, like I said, he's in our small group, and um, he's so hungry for God, and he, he doesn't know anything. You know, he's just learning uh, and it's so refreshing because he'll ask all kinds of just incredible questions, and uh, you know, and, and it's just it's just cool to see how he's he's thriving and how he's growing in his faith. And he just made that decision to say, "Okay, I'm crowning you, Jesus, as my as my King." He heard about him, heard some stories about him, some incredible stories about him at Faith Walk and other people who walk with Jesus. But he had to make that decision to say, "Okay, I'm making you." my king. I'm putting my faith in you, Jesus. And I, I love that that's how he did that. And so, uh, so this is what I just wanted you to think about before we wrap up here. And that is this. Um, when you make Jesus your king, when you make that decision to crown him as king, when you do that, um, I, I don't want you thinking like it is in the UK or in other kingdoms. Um, it's, it's not like you're a second-class commoner. It's not like you're just some subject, Okay. That's not what Scripture tells us. You become part of the royal family. You become part of the royal family. You become what Scripture describes as a joint heir with Christ. Look at Romans 8, 17. Paul writes this, Now, if we are children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. So Jesus Christ is the king. The whole kingdom and all of it and everything in it belongs to him right? It's all his, but you're a co-heir with Christ. You are part of the royal family. It's not like, you know, he's here and he's going to beat you down and keep you in your subservient little position here, you little wretched worm of a self, you know? <laughs> That's one line I don't like about, anyway, we'll get in that another time. Some songs I don't like how they're written, but anyway, but they're historic songs. You kind of got to leave them alone. But uh, anyway, but, but that's not, no, he doesn't keep you there. He said, no, 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 you were created in the image of God. <laughs> you were created in the image of God. His breath is in your lungs. His spirit lives in you. His resurrection power is available to you. His life is there for you. Life and life to the full is there for you. And, and that's what he invites you into, to be the joint heir with Christ, to be a child of the king, to be part of the royal family. That's what you're invited to. That's what he sees you as. That's the identity he wants you to take on. That's what he wants you to walk in. And so I, I love that. I love that about him, but that only happens as you crown him king in your life. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but I'll just tell you, you know, Queen Elizabeth died uh, back on, was it September 8th, 2022 is when she passed away. And her son, Prince Charles became king immediately, like as soon as she breathed her last breath, uh, he is king, okay? But from September to May, you know, all those many months, what's that, seven, eight months in there, until he was coronated in May, um, he, he didn't hold in his hand the scepter that represented the authority of the king. He didn't wear the crown that represented the authority of the king. He didn't wear any of that until he actually had his coronation ceremony, this big, huge, crazy ceremony that I didn't get invited to. I was kind of hurt, but it's okay. Um, but anyway, uh, but, but, you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't get, he, he was still king, but until they crowned him as king, he didn't hold that scepter that represented his authority. By the way, that scepter is worth about $400 million. <laughs> we show, show a picture of that thing. It's crazy. That diamond right there is from the largest diamond ever found, uh, and it's the largest stone cut from. It's called the uh, Cullinan uh, two. That one is. And uh, anyway, it's worth $400 million. And then here's his crown. Um, so that thing, this diamond right here, that's also cut from the same stone. They say that thing, <laughs> it's got like 2,300 jewels on it. That thing is worth about $5 billion. 
That's a lot of money. Yeah. Think about that next time you go to Burger King. Okay. So it's worth a lot of money. Okay. So, okay. So, so, okay. So, so he did, never mind. So he, you need a lot of glitter. But anyway, he, uh, but he, he, did, he didn't get the scepter and, or the crown. He was king, but he didn't get the scepter or the crown until the coronation when they actually crowned him as king. That's when he had the symbol of the authority, right? The crown that said, yes, I am the sovereign king of the United Kingdom and, and all of its affiliates. And so, so I just want you to see that, again, it matters that you crown him as king. It matters that you say, yes, you are not just you know, the king of whatever. You're my king, Jesus. You're my king. And that's what he invites you to. The life that he has for you flows out of that. And so uh, this is how I say it in your notes. You will experience the life-giving resurrection power of Jesus in proportion to your submission and devotion to him. So any area of your life that's not surrendered to him, you're missing out on the life that he has for you. You'll experience the life-giving resurrection power of Jesus in proportion to your submission and devotion to him. So I went through our cards last night, and most people who were here, who were here last night were, were already Christ followers, you know, and that's probably true for many of you in the room this morning. Probably most of you are already Christ followers. I would just ask you, is there any area of your life where he's not king, where you haven't crowned it? You're, like you're still on the throne in that area, or maybe he or she's still on the throne in that area. You know what I'm saying? Is there any part of your life where he's not king? And to the extent that you submit and devote yourself to him, you experience life in all areas. Would you, would you just say, okay, Jesus, I crown you as king today. In fact, uh, you know, we, we say it so often, but the best way to start your day is I submit to you my will, my rights, and all control of Jesus. Before you even get out of bed, I submit to you my will, my rights, and all control to you. You are my king. And at the end of your day, is there anything in my life today, Jesus, that I haven't submitted to you? Is there anything in my life today that you're not king of? And make that right with him. Stay under his lordship. Stay under his kingship. Life flows in direct proportion to your desire to do that, to submit yourself, to be devoted to him. Romans 10, 9. I love this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. <laughs> You'll, you'll have that life, okay? So, so you've you got, you got, you got to make him Lord. You've got to make him Lord, and then every day, you just crown him king over this and crown him king over that. Stand in the authority he's given you. Put yourself under his authority. Stay in the center of the life he's called you to. And that's where life, real life, resurrection life, the life that Jesus died on the cross for you to have, that's where that life is found. And he wants so much for you to experience that, for you to have that, not just in eternity. That's going to be amazing, way better than Buckingham Palace or Windsor Palace or Ivy Cottage or anywhere else. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing. But even in this life, the dead places brought back to life, the broken places put back together. That's what he does. That's who he is. <laughs> but you do have to crown him as king to experience that. So my prayer is just, would you, would you do that? Would you do that? Let's take a moment and pray together. So God, I uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us who we are, how you see us, what we can be, the life we can have. I thank you that we're not outside the walls of this grand palace somewhere wondering what you're like inside and what you're enjoying in there, that you invite us in, <laughs> this royal family, join heirs. That's who we are, made in the image of God, made to live out this incredible life you created us for now and in all eternity. So God, just all across the room, if, if there's any place in our hearts that you're not king, if, if just all of you, everybody here, would you just ask Jesus, Jesus, is there any part of me that you're not king of? You're not Lord of? If I haven't submitted to you,
devoted to you. Would you be willing to trade that in for the resurrection life? The life Jesus has for you. You just confess that to him, repent of that today. Jesus says, this doesn't really belong to you. I've held on to this. It's not right. I, I confess that I'm giving it to you this morning. I'm going to live life differently in that area now. For some of you today, it may be that you want to begin a relationship with Jesus today. Like you, you haven't already done that. You want to begin that relationship with Jesus today. And if that's you, would you just pray a very simple prayer? Just, Jesus, I confess that you are Lord of me. <laughs> I declare now, you are my king. I I know I've messed up. I know I've done things that are wrong. I believe you died on that cross to pay for all of that. And you were raised again to life on that third day. Because of that, I can have life. I can have life. Give me your life, Jesus. Give me life. Fill me with your life. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, we pray these things, Lord. Amen. Amen. With just a couple of things, I'll get you out of here fast, I promise you. Uh, on your uh, survey card there, uh, if you guys would, just make sure you fill that out. And you got at the bottom, it says A, B, C, or D. And uh, those are not categories. Uh, it's not like for Ray, this is Baptist church and Catholic church or whatever. <laughs> this, is, these are, this is not for that. They stand for something very specific. This is what I'd like you to do. We'll just fill it up on the screen. A is if you already know Jesus personally, like when you walked in the door today, you already know Jesus, you already had a relationship with Jesus, uh, then circle A. B, if you've prayed that prayer with me just now to begin a relationship with Jesus, would you circle B? You just let us know about that. And then C is just, hey, I really want to consider this a little bit more. I need to spend some more time with this. I'm not quite sure. I'm glad I was here today, but I need to kind of check this out. Um, circle C on there. And by the way, if that's you, please pick up uh, one of these on your way out. This is the How to Find God New Testament. Uh, the first 41 pages in here are to help you find God, to help you on that journey uh, and answer your questions about Jesus, about God, as you consider these things. And know that we'll be praying for you, and, and hopefully next Easter you'll be over there in the A or B category. And then the D is I've decided that I don't want a relationship with Jesus, and that that's just kind of where you are right now. So if you would just circle one of those, that would be great. Leave these in your seats as you exit, and uh, we'll pick those up after you leave this morning. So just leave those right there uh, where you found them, and that will be great. Uh, so we do have the Bibles available for you uh, at the Information Center in the other building and also in this building on the left side as you exit. Uh, we also have our Pray First books like this. Uh, these are incredible to help you with your prayer life. These are also free uh, in this building or the other building. And then if you uh, did circle, be on there that you're beginning a relationship with Jesus, or if you just want one, uh, write on your card there. Uh, if, you, if you put be on there and give us your address, we're going to send you one anyway. Um, but if, uh, if you would like one of these, this is called What's Next. It's like, okay, I've made this decision to begin this relationship with Jesus Christ. What's next? Well, that's what this whole book is about, and, uh, and we'll send you one of those if you put your address on your card there. So again, leave those cards in your seat backs. Uh, prayer team, could you guys go get in place right here? If you'd like somebody to pray with you or for you, um, they would be honored to do that. As soon as we dismiss, just come see them right here. Uh, my wife, Sharon, and I will be right here, and so if you'd like to meet us, uh, come up and say hello, especially if we haven't met you yet. Come by and, and say hi. We'll be right here up front. And uh, yeah, stand up. Let me uh, send you out with your blessings. So uh, yeah. So I bless you in the name of Jesus that you may experience and enjoy the abundant life and countless blessings God reserves for his royal family. God bless you. Have a great Easter day.
Thank you. 